Good morning. Good morning to you in the sanctuary and to those who are tuning in in internet land. I'm Pastor Jane Ayers. I'm not Pastor Norman. You can tell the difference because I'm better looking than he is. Just don't tell him. <laughs> but I do greet you in the name of our Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. It is my fervent prayer that as we enter into worship with heart and soul and voice, that we'll receive the blessing God means to give us for this time together in this holy place. I wanted to uh, lift up a few announcements because many of them are printed in the bulletin and otherwise made known to you, I think, even online. But please note that uh, coming ahead, there'll be various meetings of church committees in August, and in August is also the ice cream social. Ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream, right? <laughs> so if you um, can give a helping hand, I think, to, to Debbie, she'd be grateful for your assistance, but certainly come out and enjoy that opportunity uh, in August. I think it's the 20th, is that correct? Yes, August the 20th. Then there's an opportunity for you to serve our young students in our schools around the area. If you grab a backpack, uh, either on the front door uh, or out in the uh, North X or on the doors at the breezeway, um, you can find something on a little card and bring it in to help a child be well supplied for the school year that uh, will probably be on us sooner than we want to admit. And I want to thank Pastor Norm for this opportunity he gave me to preach this morning. I typically attend the 815 service. Started here at Heaven to Grace in, in about March, I think. And so uh, moving up out of the pew into the pulpit is an honor, and I'm grateful that he extended that invitation to me. I want to note that the church has been warm and welcoming to me, um, and I appreciate it very much, and um, just uh, encourage you to keep it up. You never know. Uh, who walks into your midst, <laughs> and how that relationship and that connection might unfold. Now I want to invite you to take a deep breath, and slowly let it out. And Becky will help us enter into worship. Good morning. Good morning. I know all of you join me in welcoming Pastor Jane to our worship this morning. And now please stand in heart or body. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The risen Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. As a sign of the reconciliation Jesus Christ has made between us and God, and our desire to be reconciled with others, we pass God's peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. And now please share signs of peace with one another.
Please be seated. And join me in the opening prayer. Loving God, lead us beyond ourselves to care and protect, to nourish and shape, to challenge and energize both the life and the world you have given us. God of light and God of darkness, God of conscience and God of courage, lead us through these days beyond our fear, apathy, and defensiveness to new hope in you and to hearts full of faith. Amen. We come now to our time in worship to lift up to the throne of heavenly grace our joys, concerns, and even in silence, name those uh, joys and concerns we carry in our hearts. So this morning, I bid your prayers for Carl and his mother, Pat. He's dealing with uh, serious cancer, and she has medical issues, and they are grateful for your uh, prayers and cards. I pray that you'll continue to support the family in those ways and in other ways that the Spirit might lead you. I bid your prayers for Phyllis, former Sunday school teacher recovering from cataract surgery, for Elma, Shirley's mother being cared for at home, battling several tumors. Rosalie, widow of Ken or Buddy for ca um, cataract surgery this week. For Connie, wife of Harry, recovering from a procedure to treat chronic pain. And here she is. <laughs> and I think you're doing as well. Praise the Lord. We'll shift that from the concern column to the joy this morning, but you, we want to pray you the rest of the way in your recovery. Pray, I bid your prayers for a gardener, husband of Pam, recovering from injuries from a serious auto accident. For Susie, resident at St. John's Tower, recovering still from a fall. For those battling COVID, including Mark and John and members of Pat's family, and I understand that there's been an outbreak of COVID at Hopewell, up the road, and the other church that the pastor serves between the two. The church is likely to be closed for two weeks because several people, including the pastor, if I remember that correctly, have come down with the um, virus. So please um, can pray and reach out in any way that would be appropriate for you. I bid your prayers for Rachel, Ridge's daughter, dealing with health issues, for Ned and Linda's grandson, Brandon, and for Grace, soon to welcome the newest member of the family. Pray for a safe and healthy outcome. I bid your prayers for those undergoing chemo and radiation treatment, for the people of Ukraine and Russia, and for peace between nations, for traveling mercies for those on our highways and byways this summer, and for those recovering from the recent storm. As I came in this morning, there are still trees and limbs and debris cluttering up the landscape. And I imagine that the tree companies are just working overtime to uh, help get the um, storm debris cleared up. Then there are the uh, joys and the gratitudes that we have um, to express. And um, we give thanks to God for those that are recovering and have recovered from COVID, and I'll ask for your prayer support with uh, those who are uh, grateful for God's actions and movements in their lives. Now I invite us for a few moments of silence 
to lift up those concerns and joys in our hearts before I offer the pastoral prayer. Our great love, we thank you for living in us and through us and for your mercy and love that comes to us and at us at all times. We lift up to you this morning the human conditions and situations in which we have named aloud and those we carry in our hearts. We pray you move with all your providential favor towards the sick and the recovering, those who know they're likely to be on their journey for the long haul, but abide with them, grant them your peace, Restore them to newness of health, as is possible. And we know that with you, all things are possible. Be with those who mourn this day. Comfort and console them. Give them strength for their journey. And enable us in our small ways to minister to the bereaved. We thank you for all the ways in which you've been active in our lives, in the lives of others, and in this world, stirring up good every morning. May we be a part of it and certainly not be in the way of it. And we pray that you will surprise us with small joys and pieces of beauty scattered through this day and keep our eyes ever open and ourselves ready to be part of that good that flows from you in great generosity. These prayers we offer in all your holy names. Amen. Our scripture lesson is from Genesis chapter 32. Jacob is returning home after many years. He fled home because his brother Esau, whom Jacob had cheated, had planned to kill him in revenge. Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, I have lived with Laban as an alien and stayed until now, and I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female slaves, and I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I might find favor in your sight. The messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and four hundred men are with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that were with him, and the flocks and herds and camels, into two companies, thinking, If Esau comes to one company and destroys it, then the company that is left will escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us all, the mothers with the children. Yet you have said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, 
which cannot be counted because of their number. So he spent that night there, and from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. These he delivered into the hand of his servants, each drove by itself, and said to his servants, Pass on ahead of me and put a space between drove and drove. He instructed the foremost, When Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, To whom do you belong? Where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? Then you shall say, They belong to your servant Jacob. They are a present sent to my lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you meet him, and you shall say, Moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterwards I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him, and he himself spent that night in the camp. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because God struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. This is the word of the Lord. Our time for the children's message has arrived. Would uh, the girls come down, or are they content where they are? Great. I would love to meet them. Come on down. While you do that, let me greet our other young friends uh, that may be in, tuned in on the Internet. There would be Emily and Ashlyn and Aidlyn, Molly and Lola. Riley, Macy, Macy, and Haley, Emmett, and Addie, and Autumn, and Amira, Roy, Jill, and James, there's Zoe, and Max, and Scott, Scout, and Wyatt, Will, and Amelia, and Eliana, and Breezy, Taylor, and Maddie, and Jasper, and Charlotte, Booty, and Ian, and Jesse. Chili and Ben, I might be saying that wrong, Camille and Evelyn and Rainey and Lorelai and Eli and Elena and Lillian and Michael and Iris and Hazel and Andrew and Emmy. And if I've missed anyone, I'm really sorry. But we're glad that you may be tuning in this morning. Now I'm going to come down. Good morning. I'm so glad you, you came down to sit down front. Thank you. Do you know how you say thank you in sign language? You just go like this. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't that cool? I bet your mom has nicknames for you girls. Does she say, does she call you sweetie sometimes? Does dad call you that or? Uh-huh. 
and does do you get called sometimes honey not maybe not honey I can think of some other names though that moms and dads might call their children like um, sweetie pie <laughs> even though they're not pies really sweetie pie and sometimes I call my kids honey bunches like after the cereal <laughs> And sometimes you can call a nickname for your youngster like um, uh, uh, Darlin. Come here, Darlin. Mommy needs you. Come here, Darlin. Don't do that, Darlin. <laughs> Might say it like that. I know a mom who called her child Treasure. So I was at a dinner time as a guest at somebody's house. And that mom was there, and the kids were playing outside, and she went to the back door, and uh, she was from New Zealand. And she said, Tricia, Tricia, come in for dinner. And I thought, what a great name to call your kid Treasure. And the other name I never heard of before, a nickname, is Lovey. And when I was in a Montessori school helping to teach there, the teacher called the kids Lovey. And I've not heard that before. It's like, lovey, you have to wash your hands before we eat. Lovey, you have to put the toys away before we go outside. Now, there's another name. It's not quite a nickname, but another name for God that's like lovey, but it's just love. You can call God love. So, here's what I'd like for you to do this week when you say your prayers. At bedtime, or at grace, you might say, loving God. You might say, God of love. Or you might just say, love, thank you for this food that I'm about to eat. Loving God, bless mommy and daddy and my little sister. All those ways that you might pray this week with the word and the name of God, love. So what's the name for God? Love. And you can use that in your prayer. I'm going to invite the congregation to do that as well. This week, while you're at prayer, in the morning, in the evening, through the course of the day, you might pray, oh, great love, loving God, God of love, and see how that feels in your spirit and soul. All right, thank you for coming down, and I'll let you go back up again. All right, in your pretty dresses. Oh. Can you go that way? on earth and let it begin with me let there be peace on earth the peace that was meant to be with God our creator children all are we let us walk with each other in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow To take each moment and live each
each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be with God as our Father, brothers all are we. Let me walk with my brother in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it be. Thank you so much. I suspect that if Jacob had had a United Methodist hymnal in his pocket, after that wrestling was over, he'd have launched into that hymn. Again, I want to thank you for your warm welcome this morning and for the opportunity to bring a word from the Lord to you, to us, this day. Will you pray with me? And now, O oh God, either through me or in spite of me, let your word come to your people to be a blessing and a challenge. And having heard your word, let it take root in our lives and bear good fruit for the coming of your kingdom on earth as it has in heaven. Amen. When I was a United Methodist missionary in war-torn former Yugoslavia, specifically in Bosnia, God gave me a lovely friend for the time that I was there. One evening, uh, Zelenka invited me to her apartment for dinner and a movie. And since I was used to walking all over the city of Zenica, the mile or two to her place was easily accomplished. The sidewalks that I would take to her apartment curved alongside the river running right through the middle of that steel town. One side was a pretty park, and on the other side, a stretch of tower blocks, one of which contained her apartment. Well, dinner came and went. The movie was great. And then I realized in the course of a pleasant evening, night had fallen. Glancing out at the dark beyond the windows, I panicked at the thought of having to walk home. The danger of being out at night, a woman alone, scared the daylights out of me. But my friend was ever reassuring. 
It would be perfectly safe for me, she said, to walk home in the dark. I did, and she was right. Walking in the dark that night was really a first for me. Never in my wildest moments in Maryland had I ever ventured out after dark alone to walk from here to there and back again. No way, don't do it, not safe. But in Bosnia, I repeated that exercise numerous times, much to my delight. When the black velvet of heaven is seated with stars and the moon in its phases of either bright or dim, the hours after sunset have a mixed reputation. Under cover of darkness, the good, the bad, and the ugly can and does happen. Most of us have been taught to fear darkness because of the bad and the ugly, sometimes for good reason. We avoid the night as much as possible. We pay little or no attention to the good there might be in the hours of darkness. We don't usually expect gifts after the sun goes down. Plenty of scriptures reference the perils of nighttime, relating it to evil, to mortal and spiritual danger, reinforcing our frights. So we grope for the light switch. We search for the flashlight. We hunt for the candles, then the matches. We line the hallway from the bedroom to the bathroom with night lights, doing everything we can to stay in the light and stave off the darkness. Plenty of our hymns prefer light over darkness. And I must admit that a favorite of mine has an opening line that sticks in my brain like Velcro. I want to walk as a child of the light. I want to walk as a child of the light. I want to follow Jesus. I see some of you recognize that one. But between the dark and the daylight, the hours can and do have their good side. Nighttime can be quiet, restful, restorative, and dreamy. After a good night's sleep, we might feel like we can get up in the morning and tackle the day. Except if you're my daughter, and she needs a cup of coffee before anything, and has a mug that says, there's not enough coffee in this world to make me a morning person. Darkness can be graced, redemptive. Healing and blessing can be had while it's dark. You've been hearing the story of Abraham over these past couple of weeks. So you remember that God took him out at night surveying the stars above and said, your descendants will be as numerous as these. <clears throat> You may recall the exodus happened at nighttime. Manna fell from the sky in the wilderness at night, and God parted the Red Sea in pitch black with nary a flashlight. And then there's our story today of Jacob. I don't know if Jacob was afraid of the dark or open to its graces, or both. But there he is, traveling in broad daylight until nightfall. He's on his way to reconcile with Esau, bringing along his entire household and a parade of presents that I think he hopes will trick Esau into assuaging that long held anger. The anticipated reunion has been a long time coming. 
all their growing up years, these boys were estranged from each other. And the basis of their rivalry seems to have been Jacob's belief that God loved him and hated Esau. Such dualistic thinking that God can only love one and or the other, but not both, set Jacob up with a sense of entitlement. He struggled with Esau from the womb, then stole Esau's birthright, receiving his father's blessing instead. Then he went on to connive and deceive and strategize to his own advantage with his father-in-law, Laban. Eventually, he did become a wealthy man, except for the one thing his money cannot buy, the one thing his conniving cannot acquire. He doesn't have a relationship with the one closest to him since birth, besides his mother. There's love lost here, and I believe that Jacob knows it deep in here. On his way to make things right, Jacob has prayed. You can reread that portion of today's text, verses 9 to 12 of Jacob's prayer. But basically, he is addressing the God of Abraham and Isaac and telling that God, I don't deserve all the love and loyalty you have shown me. And he pleads with God, save me from the violence of my brother, my angry brother. I'm afraid he'll come and attack us all. And now it's sundown and time to encamp. So Jacob organizes his wives and children and worldly goods to cross the Jabbok while he remains alone on his side of the river, though he's not as solitary as he imagines. In the morning, there will be Esau to face, who is coming for him with hundreds of men. He is fearful and anxious, and that night, uh, if it could hold any graces for him, is probably farthest from his mind. It will most likely be a toss-and-turn kind of night. And indeed it is. But sometime in the hours of darkness, Someone initiates a wrestling match with Jacob at the Jabbok. And all through the night, that struggle ensues and is too close to call. In some of the tosses and turns, it's impossible to tell who's who and who is doing what to whom. If you had a ringside seat, you might wonder if you're watching a dance of intimacy or a wrestling match with moves like half Nelson, leg lock, and devil tail elbow slammer. Now, see, you didn't think I knew that move. (laughs) Plenty of Bible scholars have theories about who Jacob is wrestling with. Some suggest his opponent is Esau, sneaking up for a rematch of their wrestling in the womb. Some say it's an angel. Still others, a river demon or an old night demon, taking Jacob to the mat. But for most of the account, however, the Hebrew word clearly says it's a man, an ish. That's the Hebrew word. I use that Hebrew word now in my sermon, just so you know that I'm seminary educated. (laughs) It's a human being that has engaged Jacob at the river. And by the wee small hours of the morning, 
Jacob has a hold on this being who appears to be begging for mercy. Let me go, for the day is now breaking. The plea sounds a little bit like it came right out of a Dracula or a werewolf movie. Let me go, for the day is breaking. Is this adversary some monster whose power diminishes at the break of day? Any conclusion that Jacob can in fact overpower and triumph over this being, however, is thwarted because all that being has to do is touch the thigh of the muscle of his thigh and knock his hip out of joint. Could it be this being might very easily overtake Jacob with minimal effort, but perhaps chooses a different way? The opponent, for all his striving to be done by daybreak, is not the declared loser, nor is Jacob declared the winner, even though he comes away with a blessing. But he is forever changed because finally he understands this mysterious one with whom he has striven all night is none other than God, the Holy One. And the point is not that God disclose, fears disclosure of the divine identity at daybreak but that Jacob could and would see himself differently by morning light, in the morning light. Could it be this plea, let me go for day is breaking, is the sign of a God so strong that God is willing to become weak in order to change that trickster? God self-limiting in order to mature Jacob and us. Because in this story, I hear echoes of God's self-limiting power in Philippians. Paul's letter to that church in chapter 2, I encourage you to read it before this day is over where Christ Jesus had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. And when the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. And having become human, he stayed human. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life, then died a selfless, obedient death. A death on a cross. And yet, even there, his love would not stop till his last breath. As we watch this wrestling match at the Jabbok, is it really love at work in the murky night? Sweaty, gritty, persistent, muscular love, striving to change the man, Jacob. Charles Wesley thought so. He wrote a hymn about this match at the river. Beautiful poetry proclaiming the nature and name of Jacob's opponent is love. And I'm with Wesley on that one, 100%. How else could Jacob meet Esau in the morning, receive his brother's 
surprising, gracious welcome, and in reconciliation, take up a life-giving future that he didn't have before the wrestling match, if not for love. <clears throat> this God moment of our spiritual ancestor was unexpected in time and place, mysteriously felt and unknown for a period of time and undeserved even by Jacob's own words. But if for him, so for us. Encounters with God, moments with the divine are not under our control. We cannot manage them. Yet how many times have we rejected love because it didn't present itself in the way we expected? It didn't arrive in the form we thought would be acceptable. Yet love will come at us whenever, wherever. It's what God desires for us, for the human family. It's God's nature to love us just the way we are, but too much to leave us that way. The hope and prayer is that when love comes, we rise up to engage it. The Holy One would bring us forward into all that's life-giving. Maybe kicking and screaming sometimes. Maybe limping or stumbling, sometimes dancing. But always glad that the outcome was better than we could have imagined. And that, my friends, is one definition of a blessing, having received from God something better than we could have ever imagined. Amen.
without the God of love, whose mercies flow to us, unending, unceasing. I send you forth from the service, from worship today, because your service just begins. And may you be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And um, we do have a prayer after the... Oh, no, no, no. Yes. I'm sorry. I got too excited about the hymn. Please be seated. <laughs> I love it when people in the congregation or at the orchid keep me straight. Thank you. But it is a joy for this time in the service to offer ourselves, our gifts, our time, and our treasure. And so as we hear the offertory uh, and prepare to give of ourselves, uh, the question is, how can we reflect God's matchless love to others? in gratitude for all the ways in which you give of yourselves for the ministry and mission of this church, let us be joined together in a prayer of thanksgiving. Holy God, we adore you. Thank you for making your name love, your nature compassion, your presence joy, your word truth, your spirit goodness, your holiness beauty, your well peace, your service perfect freedom. Thank you for giving us eternal life, knowledge of you. <clears throat> Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Glory is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I do send you from worship into service. Wherever your paths cross with others this week, may love be what you'll be known for. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. As is your custom, um, please allow families that need to use the ramp to exit the sanctuary first, and you certainly have the invitation to uh, remain in your seats and listen and meditate on the prelude.